Hello, everyone. For those of you that joined early, I'm really sorry I had to take you away from that game of Pong where Big Tuna seems to always be winning. Um, no surprise. Uh, but we have a great demo to share with you today. My name is Tegan Clary. I'm the VP of Marketing at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator. And thanks for joining us for this live demo of Big Tuna. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the demo. To ask questions, all you have to do is click on the Q&A button at the top or bottom of your um, Zoom screen and type in your questions. Uh, Joe and I will get to as many of them as we can today. And now I'd like to introduce Joe Barco, our Senior Director of Marketing. Hey, Joe, nice good to morning, see you. Hey. How are you today? Likewise. I'm good. Good, awesome. I'm doing great. Today, Joe will take us through a quick demo of how easy it is to um, buffer exchange and concentrate gene therapy products like AAVs, vaccine products like LNPs uh, using Big Tuna. You'll see how easy it is for Joe to set it up um, and you'll get to see it in action during an experiment and see how the hardware moves around. So Joe, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, looking forward to it. Thanks, Tegan. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning. As Tegan said, I'm going to talk about Big Tuna which is a fully automated buffer exchange platform. And we can use, you can use Big Tuna to automate buffer exchange for proteins, nucleic acids, AAVs, LNPs, VLPs, and pretty much anything that you need to do buffer exchange and sample concentration on. As our customers started to move more towards AAVs and LNPs, we discovered that there were better things we can do with Big Tuna to allow those customers to have a better, uh, better success with those particular applications. AAVs, for example, need 100-fold concentration factors and capabilities to do that. LNPs, you need to quickly remove ethanol in order to preserve the capsid. So along the way, we also added features that would benefit people who are doing low concentration nucleic acids and proteins as well. So first, for those of you who are not familiar with Big Tuna, it is a plate-based buffer exchange system. You have two versions of, on filters that you can use, uh, which is a 96 format which does a 100 to 450 microliter working range, or an unfiltered 24 format, which has a working range of 450 microliters to 8 mils. What we're going to do is we're going to start with the software, and then we'll come back and see Big Tuna in action. So let's go do the software. Now, what you can see from the software, people, when they're doing buffer exchange, they're often very, simp very quick and easy things to do. And now we're talking about automating it. And so it might seem intimidating to now suddenly have to learn a platform to automate buffer exchange. And we made it purposely super, super simple that anyone could just walk up and learn how to use it and become an expert and working with it very quickly. So there's not a whole uh, lot of different uh, ways to go wrong in this. There's a very basic menu of things where you can look at it, previous experiments, uh, control the hardware from an initialization standpoint, add and remove uh, specific operators, and do a third-party integration with it. But for the most part, you're on this main screen, which has four big buttons about what to do. Today, we'll create a new experiment. What we're going to do is we'll walk through, work through an example where we were uh, exchanging and concentrating AAVs, and that will highlight some of the new features along the way. First thing you'll see is at the top of the menu, you have a chevron and a set of chevrons, which is an experiment uh, wizard. And this will walk, walk you through step by step about how to run and set up an experiment. On the first screen, we're just going to give the experiment a name and pick the unfilter type we're using. So we'll call it AAV demo. Um, and we will call this today's demo. You have three applications to pick from. You have buffer exchange and concentration, uh, which is an optional step at the end of the buffer exchange process. You have concentrate only, which is just to take your samples and concentrate without doing any buffer exchange. And a new application we've added, which is reduced sample volume. And what this allows you to do is start with as much as 50 mils of sample and then concentrate that down to eight mils within the unfiltered 24. And you can do that on 24 samples simultaneously. The next option to do is to pick the plate type, which is unfiltered 24 or 96. We'll do an unfiltered 24. And then the molecular weight cutoff. So we've had a 10 kilodalton molecular weight cutoff for everything. Uh, we've added uh, a 30 kilodalton, which is uh, good for proteins and AAVs. And we've added 100 kilodaltons, which is really good for LNPs. So we're going to start with the 30 kilodalton. We'll click Next. 
And the next screen will enter information about what samples and buffers we're going to be using. I can type the samples in one by one, or I can import them from a list. And I will import them and then show you the format. So you can see I can pull in this list. Here's my AAVs. Here's the sample concentration. The format of the file is pretty basic, which is a sample name. It's a, a CSV file, a tab delimited file. Sample name, concentration, and the unit. You can put in other information, such as well ID, if you are, have loaded the plate on a different system. Or you could pull it from another limbs, and if there's columns that Big Tuna doesn't recognize, it will just ignore those. You can do the same thing on the buffer side, but we're just going to do one buffer today for the demo. And so I'll just type this one in manually. And we'll move on to the next step. The next step is where we're going to map where everything's going to be in the unfilter and what we want to exchange. So I can click this button here at the plate to hit select all. And then I click and drag samples in. And I do the same thing on the buffer side. Now, I'm going to highlight a feature of BigTuna, which is really good for someone who's just learning how to use it. You'll notice that this next button is grayed out. And that's because I've done something wrong, and it's obvious to BigTuna, and so it's not going to let me move on to the next step. It will tell me what the error is, which is, in this case, not all samples are allocated to the unfilter. So I added one sample, and I gave a list of 24. So either I'm exchanging one sample or I'm exchanging 24. So I want to exchange 24. So let me check this again. Clear selected samples. Now I will select all my samples, drag them in, and there's my map. And now my next button is activated, so I'll move on. What it's going to ask you is what reservoir you want to use for buffer. Since we are only doing one buffer, it will pick the obvious one, which is a single trough reservoir. If you are out of that reservoir, uh, you can go on to one of these other ones and choose those and continue running your experiment. So it gives you that option to do, to do that with all compatible reservoirs. The parameters page is where we'll set up the conditions for the actual exchange and concentration run. First, in the sample information section, I want to highlight that we've added different sample presets. So if you've walked up to Big Tuna for the very first time, there's, this might seem overwhelming, where you have a lot of different parameters to pick from. But really, what you, all you really have to do is come to these sample types and pick the sample that is closest to what you're actually planning to use. And we developed these presets to be the best starting conditions for each of these different sample types. So we're going to pick AAVs. And you'll see another feature of Big Tuna, which is uh, this red text and the outline, which is telling you you have either information missing or you need to have information within a certain range. So it's asking me for the volume I'm going to use. Uh, we are doing an 8 mil uh, unfiltered 24. So let's start with an 8 mil volume. And then let's end at a 2 mil volume for the purposes of the demo. In the system section, what we have defaulted to use are the best conditions for the sample preset and the play type. When you become an expert, which will be probably the second or third time you use it, you have the option to go and change. You should change these, and if, if that's appropriate for your sample. But it will always start you at what's the best, what we've determined is the best condition to run those sample types. AAVs flow really fast. And so to, for the exchange process, we want to run it at a low pressure to ensure that everything's running uniformly and consistently. So this preset is tied to 15 PSI. You have the option to uncheck that. Uh, and select a different, a different pressure for the exchange process. You also have the option to set a different mixing speed based on what you feel comfortable with running it. Mixing helps things run faster and more uniformly, and uh, generally we recommend leaving that on. And then duty cycle is how much during the buffer exchange process you want to do the mix. So let's go back to the recommended settings. And then you have a tip reuse option. And the tip reuse is to, if I'm using buffer or using the same buffers, rather than changing tips at every single exchange cycle, it's going to hold on to those tips and reuse those for up to 12 cycles. You're probably noticing another feature of Big Tuna software, which are these tool tips. And the tool tips are reminders for what a button might be or what it's supposed to do if you've, uh, you're not sure or it's been a while since you've used it. The exchange section tells me how much of the old buffer I want to remove and replace. I can either set this as a percentage or a die volume or equivalent volume. 
And these radio buttons are just a calculation between the two, so they will adjust if I change one versus the other. My last uh, thing here is this target removal per cycle. This is the volume that I remove in each buffer exchange cycle. So I can do this at a uh, intermediate percent removal. Uh, if I am not familiar with my sample and we have that tied to the preset, if you, you, uh, you know your sample can be concentrated very highly or you have a large volume, you might want to ch choose a larger percent removal per cycle. You'll end up doing fewer cycles. Or if you're not sure about how your samples are going to handle uh, this exchange process, or they're very concentrated, you might choose a lower percent removal to ensure you're not causing your sample to aggregate uh, or have something else happen to it while, you're, while it's running. There's also an error recovery section, which just tells Big Tuna how you're going to handle a volume measurement error, whether you want it to stop or whether you want it to mark the well as questionable and, keep, and continue. Let's click Next here. Next page is just a prep list which is now that you have your experiment set up, you need to go gather reagents, unfilters, reservoirs, things like that. So it gives you a list as a reminder about what you have to go gather. So you can look at that by your sample type. You can look at it in a map. And if you hover over each of these, it will remind you of what's supposed to be in that well. Uh, you have your buffer list, and it tells you what volume of buffer you're expected to use. And then the buffer map, which tells you how many reservoirs you need to make, and uh, where, where those go. So you can take this and print it out and either you know, append it to a, a lab notebook or, or hand it off to someone who's going to help you prepare samples. Let's move on to the next step. This is where we start to get into business, which is, all right, now I'm ready to go. And because we want to make sure that you're going to walk away from this and you're going to be happy and ready and everything's going to work, so we make you go through step by step of checking off, yes, I've done this, and yes, I've done this. So it'll remind you to load the unfilter and where that should be on the, the orientation of that. So check the box. Tells you how many reservoirs you should have and where these will go on the system. Reminds you about how many tip racks you'll use based on your tip reuse and how many times it thinks it's going to go, how many cycles it's going to go through. This intermediate position is where it stores those tips when it's being reused. Make sure it's empty to start. And then make sure that the tip rack, this is where the tip rack goes, make sure there's not a tip rack already sitting there. You also have a reminder to make sure there's room for uh, disposing of tips, uh, disposing of buffer that comes off of the exchange process, and that the system, carboy, uh, the system fluid is full as well. Once we acknowledge all those things, we get a button to start the run. Now you'll have a, uh, we're doing this in simulation mode. So the status window is not reflecting 100% what I just showed you. However, it kind of gives you an idea about what you're going to see. So from across the room, you can look to get a sense about how far along this is going to be. It tells you how many cycles it thinks it's going to do. It tells you how long the filtration time is for each cycle and what's remaining. And if you've done an optional concentration step, you have the op it will tell you how many cycles you have left. You can see on individual wells the progress. You may notice in cases, as those of you who have done buffer exchange a lot, know that things don't run consistently 100% uh, of the time, actually probably very less than 100% uh, of the time. So you can come over here and at any point during the experiment, hover over and look to see uh, what each well is doing and uh, what, what samples might be holding you up or what samples are done. You have the option in the software now to pause the experiment and remove samples that are completed and so that pause button will go to the next exchange, end of the next pressurization cycle, do a volume measurement, and then give you another little wizard to pop up to give you a, um, give hints, give clues about what samples you're taking out. Uh, so you can take the samples out, hit continue, and then the rest of the plate will continue to exchange. At this point, you can unload the plate. You get a report. The report shows you the experiment parameters about how something was run. It tells you how many cycles it took. And then it gives information of the endpoints for each of those samples, so what percent exchange it actually achieved, uh, how much buffer was used to do the replacement, uh, making sure that the volumes are, are accurate or, or uh, what you expected. This is a, a summary report. There's a detailed report that shows all of the robot movements, and there's a, another detailed report that talks about flow, that shows flow rate for individual samples, which is also a new, a new feature in the software, and uh, keeps track of what's happening at each individual cycle. So that's the software in a nutshell. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the instrument and we'll talk about how this relates to how the hardware works.
Okay, so looking at it from above, so go left to right, you can see kind of orient yourself towards how it was in the software. You have a waste bin at the far left hand side. There's a volume sensor here, which we'll talk about in a moment. These are the positions for buffer reservoirs. So you can put up to eight reservoirs on the deck, starting at this first position and then going uh, front, to, front to back, uh, left to right. This position is for holding tips that are in the middle of a uh, process run. And then this is a fresh chip position about where it would pick and pick and place tips, uh, pick tips that are being, uh, being used. Back here are syringe pumps that will control the liquid dispensing. And then over on this side is a plate hotel or tip hotel. So the tip hotel tracks how many uh, sample, how many tips are being used in the experiment. It will always pick from this first position and then go left to right and then top to bottom uh, to use new tips. You probably noticed that Big Tuna started to move. So let's move up to the front and we'll talk about what it's actually doing. Those of you who do buffer exchange know that the process is, is kind of manual and tedious, which is you let it uh, spin for a certain amount of time, you come back, look at the volume, add new buffer, and then keep going through that cycle. So Big Tuna is replacing that process. First piece of that is the, the exchange time, so your sample is in this pressurization time, pressurization chamber. Big Tuna optimizes the algorithm in between cycles to pick the right pressurization time on the fly. So it's, no, it's not just set at a certain time, it changes every time based on how things are running. The way it knows how to adjust that is by using the volume sensor. So the volume sensor is an acoustic non-contact sensor that measures the volume of each individual well. Again, flow rate will change as your sample gets more concentrated uh, based on the formulation viscosity, a combination of the two. So it's very important, especially since we're walking away from the instrument, to ensure that we know what's happening in each individual well and that we can add volume back uh, uh, to an appropriate level. So once it's done measuring, it will put the sensor back, and now we'll start with the liquid handling piece. So the left-hand side of this arm is a six-tip liquid handler. It's gonna first make sure that the, tip, that the uh, syringes are primed, and then it's gonna go pick up, in this case, this is our first cycle, so it's gonna pick up fresh tips. It will pick up six at a time, and because we're going into either a 24-well plate or 96-well plate, it will adjust the pitch of the tips to match the unfilter that's being used. So it'll pick up, it'll aspirate liquid. If you're doing the same buffer, it will aspirate enough for multiple wells, and then do the dispense. The dispense will happen on, uh, above the well, so it never makes contact with the sample itself, so there's no risk of cross-contamination or of the tips getting contaminated. So in this case, we're just doing six wells just to do the process of uh, going through the demo. Uh, and it's gonna take those tips, put that in, in, in the intermediate position, and then it will start that pressurization cycle again. And so it uses the information about how that last cycle ran to set the pressurization time for the next cycle. Chamber door closes, and buffer exchange is a, a cycle, so it'll continue that cycle and until you have hit the, hit the uh, exchange target that you wanted. That's basically it. So at this point, uh, Tegan, maybe we can go back and talk about questions that have come in uh, about how the system works or how it might work with people's individual samples. Great, yeah, hey Joe, thanks for taking us through that. I mean, you, I think you really showed us how easy it is to walk up to that software, set up an experiment, you know, pick your molecule type, uh, set up the deck and then really get buffer exchange going in a completely automated walk away, you know, um, approach and way. So I think it, it is really, it really does save people time and our current customers I know really love being able to set it up and walk away and come back to a sample that's ready for something else. So thanks for doing that. We do have a bunch of questions. So let's go ahead and dive into those. And I know the, the big tune is going to keep moving behind you. So if anybody has any questions about the hardware, I'm sure Joe would be happy to point something out. So ask those if you have them. Um, Joe, first one here is that you showed uh, some presets specifically for AAVs. Uh, can you explain a little bit about how those presets work and what they're doing, what those presets are doing for people? Yes. So one of the things that we added uh, to Big Tuna is the ability to do the exchange at different pressure levels. The default has been 60 PSI or about 4.1 bar based on working with proteins. 
When we started to run AAVs, we found that AAVs run really fast in, in our system. So much similar to, very similar to buffer. And as a result, we wanted to be able to run that at a lower pressure and be able to control the process uh, much more effectively. So we added the capabilities to do 15 PSI. Along the way, we also realized that we could be at 30 PSI and cases where we have low concentrations of nucleic acids or low concentrations of protein, so under roughly under half a mg per mil or less, that 30 PSI was actually a, a, a good uh, intermediate point for those types of samples. So we added those sample presets to set it at the correct pressure level, mostly. And we also added the unfilter, uh, the different molecular weight cutoffs, so the 30 and 100 kDa in the unfiltered 24 to exchange, ensure that exchange happens as appropriately as possible for those molecule types. Okay, great, thanks, Joe. Uh, next one here is, can you use part of a plate? Do you have to use a whole plate for a run? You can use part of a plate. In our demo, we're not running, uh, we're running a partial plate. You can do that on the software itself. It doesn't force you to choose every well. It just makes sure you're using every sample and formulation that you've entered. But you can go back and use the rest of that plate at another point. Okay. Joe, there, this is a question about a number that showed up in the simulation. So there's a question here, just that in the demo run, it, the final volumes were a bit less than the 2000 microliters that you had entered. And somebody just asked, is that a normal outcome or did those, was there a mismatch and that was just a simulation that you used as an example? That, it was just a simulation that the data in those, uh, good, good eye when whoever found that one, yeah. but that's just a simulation and those numbers. So that was just fake data. Okay, great. And, you know, just to answer the, the, this person's question, you know, correct or accurately, when you set a volume, how close are we typically to the volumes that are requested? So we have application notes to kind of show we're, we're usually, it's more within five or 10% on things. Right. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, Joe, next one here. How does, how does it handle, handle samples that are flowing at different rates? So, right. Different, different buffers or things like that that would make things flow at different rates. How does Big Tuna handle those? We get some variant of this question every time we talk about Big Tuna, and it's a very appropriate question because, again, people who are using buffer exchange and have done centrifugation or, or even TFF know that sometimes things just flow at different uh, unpredictable rates, especially if you're doing multiple samples uh, at the same time. What Big Tuna does is it uses first the sample preset to establish the correct pressure level to run that sample type. The very first cycle, Big Tuna has not ever seen that sample before. And so what it does is it does a short pressurization burst for a couple of minutes, then goes through and measures every well and determines what the approximate flow rate is. So that gives it its first impression about how to keep uh, that sample running at the parameters that have been entered by the user. When it's running, things uh, as they exchange will sometimes change flow rates, and so it tracks it every time. If there are things within the plate that are running at different flow, uh, have different flow rates, what it will do, the default parameter is to set it, uh, the, the exchange pressurization time based on whatever's running fastest. The idea being that things that are running fast, we don't want those, those to dry out or over concentrate. And so we'll set the whole plate to that, uh, to, to ensure that that doesn't happen. So it adjusts on the fly and then tracks based on, you know, best preservation of sample. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, can somebody run more than eight mils of sample? Like if they have a higher volume of their sample they want to manage, can they do that? Yes. So that's the new application, the re reduced sample volume. There's actually two ways to do this. First way is to, you can run replicates in the plate, right? And you can run, you can run replicates and then you can tell the software they're replicates and it will handle it as a replicate. But if you're running like 40 mils and, and you have a lot of samples that you're running, one thing that you could do is this reduced sample volume. You start with eight mils in the unfiltered 24. And you have, instead of having reservoirs here, you have, uh, you have reservoirs for your sample. And so you put 10 mils in each reservoir and you can continue to pull that. So you do the pressurization and rather than exchanging into new buffer, you pull your sample in. And it's based on the volume that someone has entered. So if they have 20 mils, 20, let's say, let me do the math, 28 mils, and you have eight mils starting in here, you can tell it to add 20 mils of the new, of the buffer, of the sample, and then it will reach that, uh, finish at that eight mil volume. And then you okay. can do another, con another concentrate only experiment to that same one filter and concentrate it down from eight mils to 450 microliters. So within that, there's basically 48 mils that, uh, to start with that you can get to 450 microliters. So earlier on, I said about a hundred fold uh, concentration factor, and that's where that comes from. Okay, great. 
And um, can folks set up templates for other people to walk up to the system and use and run? Yes. So at the end of that uh, de software demo, there's a point that I can hit save and I can hit save as template. And save as template, it will have all of those parameters set up and someone can just come back in and run that exactly, or they can come in directly and change the sample names. Uh, that Chevron, once those, uh, once those steps of, of the experiment are filled out, you don't have to go back through one by one. It will know that those are filled out and just allows you to start the experiment run from there. Got it, okay. Um, what, what should somebody do if they don't know the concentration of the sample they're dealing with, but they're trying to get it from one solution to another? What do they do in that scenario, Joe, with Big Tuna? So in that scenario, it, if you know the concentration, it's always best to kind of run at similar concentrations because it just is, is more efficient, right? So if you, if you are running very large dis discrepancies of samples, it just takes, it will go, it'll just take a long time. If you don't know, it, one option to do is to run things together right now. And you can get to into the first cycle. By the first cycle, you'll know these samples are gonna run really fast. These samples are probably gonna run really slow. So you have the option to, at that point, pause, take either the fast or slow samples out and then continue with the rest, uh, the rest of the samples together. So you can group it that way, uh, or you can just kind of, or let, let the process kind of go through. Okay. So there's actually some good questions here about specifically about AAVs, Joe, and um, viral vectors. So let's like okay. maybe knock some of these out and then we can hit some of the others. Do we have any experience okay. with enveloped viruses and doing anything there? Or have we get, or any customers we've interacted with in that area? Uh, not, not to my, uh, I'm not sure what enveloped virus means. Uh, a lentivirus, we have had customers who have, have worked on that with Big Tuna. And we have customers who have used, uh, yeah, VLP, so virus-like particles. Right. And okay. Yeah, I think those are good examples. I think the lentivirus, uh, LMPs. You know, if, if some if somebody's interested in talking to us about those particular molecules and how to handle them, we'd be happy to to have that conversation with you. So, so reach out to us if you're interested in discussing that more. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the reasons to be, I mean, we've started working on AAVs is we had we had big tuna release for proteins, and someone asked us this question can we do AVs? And we said, we don't know. Let's try it. Let's see. Yeah. And here we are with now capabilities to specifically do those samples. Right. Right. Um, so there's a couple of questions here about detergents. And I think this will be in just a general question, but then also de dealing with detergents that are you know, used in like AAV production, for example. Um, is it compatible with detergents? Have we ever seen any issues? And um, you know, tell us a little bit about detergents in the system. Yeah, it's compatible with detergents in the sense that uh, there is a mixing cycle. That mixing is a gentle orbital mixing, so it, it doesn't froth or cause other uh, bad effects uh, by having the detergent there. So you can still exchange if there's detergent present. If people are exchanging and doing formulation prep, generally they would want you'd want to add the, the detergent after doing the exchange of the formulation. So so pipette that in separately. Uh, detergent is kind of is doesn't necessarily behave as, as a small molecule when you're doing uh, a molecular weight cutoff. It, it forms, uh, uh, it basically forms capsids and so. Yeah, gotcha, okay. Joe, um, the, what, what specific unfilter would we recommend people use for AAV samples? And then the kind of part of that is how, how's the volume reduced? How are we helping people reduce the volume? Right, so 30 is the recommended uh, molecular weight cutoff for AAVs. I didn't go into specifically the molecular, the membrane is an RC, regenerated cellulose membrane. So you can use 30. Uh, we've, we started with 10, 10 kilodons and those work, uh, work as well, but 30 is the preferred for AAVs. Way it reduces the volume is during this, uh, when this chamber door is closed, we apply a pressure to the entire uh, plate, the entire unfilter, and during that pressurization process, the, fil the buffer is removed from the, uh, is pushed out by the fil filter at the bottom of the plate, and that gets uh, discarded to waste. Okay, great. There's a couple of questions here about biosafety levels, working with these kinds of uh, viral mo molecules. And so, Joe, I think um, one of the questions is related to temperature control. Does big, I think we'll just hit this one. We get asked this a lot too about temperature control. Does a big tuna have it? Is there a way to cool samples or, or not? Right. It, at the moment, it does not. And, and our customers have not, uh, by and large, had any, any problem with that. 
So the exchange process happens efficiently at room temperature, and our goal is to allow exchange to happen quickly. Uh, cooling it slows down any, any flow property. So we run fast. Customers have not uh, seen a problem with this, whether we're talking about AAVs, nucleic acids, LNPs, proteins. Okay. On the biosafety level question, Joe, I mean, there's just questions yep. here about how do, we, how do we use this system in an environment like you know, BSL-2 um, where it's got to be in some sort of biocontainment. Is there a way to do that? I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I'll let you answer this too, but I would say if somebody wants to do that, I think you should talk to us about how to do that and we can work out, you know, how to, how to work with you to uh, make that happen if you wanted to do that. So reach out to us and talk about it, but Joe, do you have any experience with that or any, any ideas? Sure. A couple of things. One is I, I didn't mention about safety issues as you probably noticed, I'm like, sticking my hand in here all the time. Uh, there's normally a light curtain on, on the platform and uh, I'm living dangerously today and, and not using the light curtain. Uh, the light curtain is, is there as a default uh, for a, a general safety issue. You have an optional thing to buy an enclosure, uh, which will go over the top of it. And then there's an additional option to do a HEPA filter uh, connection to that as well. So you have the option to kind of lock this down, that lock this down to some degree. Uh, in and of itself uh, versus just going directly into a BSL-2 lab. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, Joe, just on the on the topic of like the detergents and some of the, let's call it more, you know, um, AAVs or viral vectors and crude samples, what kind of things should people do to those samples to prep them prior to this uh, process of buffer exchange? Is there something we would recommend there? Just a question here about, again, about the detergents and but how crude can the samples be to be running on Big Tuna? Yeah, it's it's kind of of a hard uh, a hard thing to to characterize uh, or to qualify. It there shouldn't necessarily be any any complicated prep behind it, right? If if you have other cell debris, you probably don't want to have that present. So if there's a solid if there's solid particles, they're just going to clog the membrane. So I would remove that. But in terms of other prep for that buffer, the whole point of this is that it just exchanges and gets into the new buffer. So you shouldn't have any any additional sample prep other than solid uh, than removing insoluble material from that. Great, okay. Yeah, I, I think that's the answer, right? As long as it won't get down on the membrane, clog it and stop flow, you can probably process yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, There's no uh, sensitivity no sensitivity to acid or base or or, uh, or salt or anything like that, so. Right, right. Okay, There's. I think there's one more question here about on the kind of viral vector okay. side. Can the instrument efficiently remove iodixanol from, um, you know, like an AAV prep sample or, and I believe we can. I know we've worked with customers yeah. to be able to do that, but um, what do you think, Joe? Can it remove iodixanol? I have not personally tested it, but I do not believe there should be any issue with that. Yeah, I agree. And I think we have worked with, yeah. A customer in a demo demo situation where there was iodixanol present, and that was one of the things we were wanting to remove. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just a few a few other quick questions here that um, like re remote access. Can somebody be in a different room, building, city, state, or country, and change parameters? Is there a way to, to manage Big Tuna remotely? Different country. Wow. Uh, yeah. You Fancy. can do. Uh, you can use a yeah. The software itself, you can use team, like something like TeamViewer and like a Microsoft program, which allows you to remote access into a machine. So you can do, you can do that um, to change parameters that way. There is an integration that's new in this version, which is a CELA license, basically a CELA driver for Big Tuna. And so you can set things up to run, uh, to change, to run that way, right? So you can run, you can call a template through, add sample names, and then run, run the system remotely that way. Okay, got it, got I it. Just need some way to bring plates and reservoirs there. Um, yeah, a few more. If we, uh, just on the protein side, somebody has a question about proteins. Have we, uh, mm -hmm. do we have any experience with sticky proteins or nanoparticles that are, you know, tend to clump up and have we seen any issues with that? Uh, sticky, I haven't, I haven't quite seen. Uh, we, we have a lot of, uh, at, at low protein concentrations, there's always a risk of losing material to the at, to the uh, to the plastic itself on any on any plastic material. So that's basically the same the same here. One thing that does work in our favor on this process is the is the orbital mixing process, mm -hmm. because by orbital mixing, uh, we're keeping that solution uniform as it's doing the exchange and concentration steps. Whereas if you're doing dead end ultrafiltration, anything that's uh, 
large or sticky, it's just going to go right to the membrane and stick there and clog and slow down the rest of your exchange process. So we have seen that that, uh, shape, that uh, orbital mixing during the exchange process has helped us keep sample more uniform. There's also another way feature in this, which I didn't talk about today, which is a, an option to dilute your sample before you actually start exchanging. So if you are concerned about uh, your protein aggregating or st being sticky, you have the ability to add the new buffer starting, which will dilute it and, and hopefully reduce the, the possibility of the, those things being an issue. Okay, there's a few a few more questions here. We'll get through all four of these, and then I think we'll have, we're, we're probably going to be out of time. But Joe, what's the smallest possible volume um, prior to exchange and after exchange that somebody can get? So, what do you need to put in? Smallest volume. What could the smallest yeah. volume you can get out? 100 microliters for both for the 96 hole plate and and uh, 450 for the unfiltered 24. So for the 96, basically it'll concentrate. Uh, to about 50 microliters and allow you to finish at about 100. There is a limit to that ultrasonic sensor. If the volume is too low, it is uh, it gets it it can't distinguish the volume from the membrane. So that's why the 50 50 microliter working limit comes from. But the end beginning and end is 100 microliters. Okay, great, great. And then on the on the volume side questions here, um, what's the maximum size of a sample you can process through big tuna, volume wise? Uh, let's uh, see. That's need, a tough one. <laughs> I need a calculator in my head. Yeah. So most I could do is I have, um, I use reduced sample volume and I use the unfiltered 24. So if I have one sample, I can put eight mils times 24 into the plate, which is 192 microliters. Then I can add another 40 times 24 to that. So I don't know if someone has a calculator here that, they're, <laughs> that they can work with. So basically I have 40 times 24 uh, what is that? Nine, 9.6 liters. Yeah. Nine point, yeah. So 9.6 yeah, liters. That's right. So we're talking basically almost 10 liters that if, if I, I could really force through in, in one okay. sample. Okay. Uh, Joe, on the good math, by the way, I'm impressed. Um, Thank the you. types of membrane, can you just remind everybody what's the, the membrane made of again yeah. for our unfiltered plates? Yeah, it's regenerated cellulose. On both play types, 96 and 24, we have 10, 30, and 100 kilodalton molecular weight cutoffs. On the 96 well plate, we also have a three kilodalton molecular weight cutoff. Okay, and then um, this, there's two questions here. I'm gonna kind of lump these together. So first is, is the system limited to the 24 and 96 uh, well unfiltered plates? And then the second part of that is, um, can you use both of them on this one system or do you need two uh, different instruments for them? Let me start with the second one first. So you can use both at, on any system. So on any, on any big tuna, I can use a 96 or 24. So that's a, a default capability on both of those. Uh, on using the other plate types, uh, no. So a couple of things. We develop these plates ourselves and partly because we are running under pressure. And so we surveyed all the other kind of molecular, uh, basically cut plate formats in here on, that were available on the market. Things just don't, they're, they're not, pressure designed. And so we design these ourselves. We do 100% pressure testing on every single well to ensure that uh, we have, uh, they're going to be robust. Uh, and there's no other plate in the market that can do that. The other piece of that is because we're measuring volume from the top of the plate, we have to know kind of the height of, of the plate. And so on our system, it's, it's tied in to measure and know the height of the plate, which isn't necessarily going to be consistent if there was another plate type in there. Okay. All right, somebody squeaked in the last questions. I'm gonna get this one and then we're gonna wrap it up. So have we encountered long, abnormally long or long cycles when dealing with high concentration proteins? Or maybe I ask you a different sure way. Normally, yeah. Yeah, how long does okay. a, a high concentration protein buffer exchange typically take? And I know there's a lot of variables in there, but just what have we normally seen? Yeah, Big t the process itself will, will time out, at, not time out, but um, it will never pressurize for more than two hours at a cycle. So that will run, that's basically how it, how it will run. Um, I think in, in, uh, in, that's like the extreme, like 200 mg per mil is probably the highest viscosity type of thing we run. AVs are like exactly the opposite, which is you could have a, a, a pressurization cycle that's six seconds, which is why it's clear why we need to do other features and have a bit flexibility to handle all sorts of different sample types because you have these two extremes that can work on the platform. Gotcha. 
Uh, and uh, I'll answer the last question. I'll let you off the hook on this one, Joe. I got a, there's a Keep question in here that says, yeah, what, what's, what's a recommended analytical system post a big tuna run? Um, and that's a great question. So, you know, we, we have analytical systems like Lunatech that can measure protein concentration, um, Stunner that actually can do a fantastic job of measuring both uh, AAV molecules, tell you what that concentration is, give you an empty full ratio, tell you if there's aggregation that's occurred after your buffer exchange. Um, and then of course we have um, our uncle system. If you're working with formulations and moving things from one solution to another into a formulation, you can assess the stability of that protein or that molecule in that formulation with uncle. So uh, big tuna is perfectly hooked up with our analytical system specifically for a lot of the work that folks are doing out there in the world. So you want to learn more, um, I think this is a perfect way to wrap this up, but if you want to learn more about Big Tuna or any of our analytical instruments for doing both the um, buffer exchange sample prep or concentration and then the analytics, reach out to us. Joe, I want to thank you for doing a fantastic job of taking us through Big Tuna today. It was really great. And I want to thank everybody for a lot of really good questions. We got a lot of questions today, so I really appreciate that. Um, if you're more interested in learning more about um, our instruments, you want to meet Joe over Zoom, just reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to set something up. Don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. We're really good at doing live demos of both Big Tuna um, and, um, sorry, uh, yeah, not live demos, virtual demos of Big Tuna and our analytical instruments. We're also able to do live demos when, when people need to as well. But reach out to us. We'd be happy to do that with you. Uh, with that, I think we'll wrap it up. And thank you for spending time with us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.